Hey, welcome to Interaxis.io, uh, Interaxis YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about stable coins. Uh, these are uh, really important and have really helped the decentralized finance movement. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they are, why we have them, uh, and talk about a few of the stable coins and how they're used. First, we need to talk about what a, a stable coin is and why we might have it. Uh, a stable coin is essentially a crypto currency. So something that exists on a, a blockchain, but it's, it's pegged, ideally, to, to some sort of fiat currency. A fiat currency is a currency that is issued by a, a government or some sort of regulatory body. Uh, in this case, most stable coins are pegged to the U.S. dollar. And the reason why they're pegged to the U.S. dollar is the U.S. dollar is pretty much the currency of record for the world. For all financial, financial transactions, for most financial transactions, it's the U.S. dollar. So this is what most stable coins are, are pegged to. Um, and they do it in a variety of ways, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first we need to talk about what happens with the U.S. dollar or the, the euro or the, the pound or, or any other fiat currency and what their governments are trying to do, why we need it stable. We need it stable because the idea is I have U.S. dollars that I, that I have in the bank, and the government wants me to feel comfortable with the fact that when I go to spend those, when I go to buy my cup of coffee or my groceries or a car or whatever it might be, that a dollar today is r worth roughly what it was yesterday plus some sort of level of inflation. So the U.S. government is looking at the economy and looking at baskets of goods and baskets of services, and they're trying to make sure that my dollar that I spend buys roughly the same uh, basket each day. Now, now that's the uh, goal that's supposed to be the goal of the Federal Reserve. Of course, you know some things have gotten a little political, and, they, and they've tried to do some other things, getting in and out of the market. But really, the idea is let's keep the U.S. dollar uh, relatively stable to buy this basket of goods plus some level of inflation. Okay, so they're monitoring inflation, they're monitoring goods and services, and they say, okay, we're, we're either going to buy the currency or sell the currency, and we're going to use interest rates to influence people and to influence behaviors so that we can keep the U.S. dollar relatively stable. And they've done such a good job of it over the years that it is the currency of record of, of the world. Uh, in exact opposite, the exact opposite of this is, is we've heard stories and, and things have happened in, in other countries in the past, in Argentina years ago, in Germany after World War I, um, more recently in, in several uh, in, in countries like Venezuela and some African countries where the government has just decided to completely devalue the currency and people, uh, you hear stories about having to have wheelbarrows full of cash in order to buy a loaf of bread. And of, of course, our government, the U.S. government, and, and, and most uh, developed country governments don't want that. They don't want you to have to have a wheelbarrow full of cash to buy uh, basic supplies, basic food. So they try to keep the price of their currency, the, the value of their currency, relatively stable. Okay, so what has happened in the what happened in the cryptocurrency world is we wanted to be able to use. Bitcoin. The goal was to use Bitcoin to be able to facilitate transactions. The problem was, when you looked at the price of Bitcoin, it was making these wild swings. And I couldn't make any sort of arrangement with someone to pay for some sort of goods out at this time frame based on Bitcoin's price here. Because I don't know what's going to happen in the meantime. So I could, I, I, I could make an, an arrangement with someone to do some sort of service for me and they deliver it in 30 days for one Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin could go from $3,000 to $6,000 and all of a sudden I'm, I'm out the difference. And that is what we call currency risk. And we did not, no one, no one would be willing to utilize Bitcoin or utilize Ether or utilize some cryptocurrencies and take on that currency risk. Uh, they were fluctuating so, so wildly. So, uh, there's been a big push in order to propel this decentralized world and decentralized finance to create some sort of stable coin. So essentially that is why we, we really uh, are in need of stable coins that, that work. Because we need sort of so, some stability and we need this ability to denote our transactions in, in a currency that we feel is stable. Now the question again is, why do we need a cryptocurrency at all to do this? Why can't we just use U.S. dollars? 
right? Because US dollars, if we use those, we're subject to, if you've seen other videos, you're, you're now subject to the fees and the friction that come from using US dollars, because to use US dollars, you have to go through a US or international bank, right? And the banks are gonna control this, and therefore they're gonna charge you fees to use their wire to, to move money back and forth. They're gonna have some friction. I gotta call the bank, I gotta go online, it's gotta be a wire transfer ACH, you're subject to banking hours, those kinds of things, um, to get it to possibly someone internationally. And, and then they have to maybe convert it to their currency. If I can do this in a cryptocurrency, it can be very seamless where I can send, maybe in this case, the, crypto, the stable coin called DAI, I can send it to someone instantaneously around the world uh, for, for a very low fee and they'll, they'll get it right away. Uh, so, so that's why we would like for it to be a cryptocurrency. The other reason we would like for it to be a cryptocurrency that is that is hopefully stable is because if it's a cryptocurrency, we can wrap it in a smart contract, right? So we could essentially have this contract that says, I'm going to ship you goods. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna ship you oil or gas or, or whatever it is across the world. So Adam is gonna sh ship to Ron some oil. Uh, I'm gonna put it on a, you know, a shipping container, put it on a ship, and as soon as it gets here, there might be some device that says, okay, the oil is reached here, that triggers a smart contract that pays me in DAI right away. There's no invoices sent. I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to wait 90 days for payment. Ron doesn't have to write a check. There's no accounts payable. There's no accounts receivable. This just happens. And the only way it can't really happen if we're using US dollars, the only way it can happen is if we're using some sort of stable coin within a smart contract. So that's why we need it to be a cryptocurrency and we're not just going to use US dollars. Uh, now we're gonna talk about what a few of the uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, the, the stable coins are. The, the kind of one of the first ones we had was called Tether, right? And it was uh, denoted USDT for Tether. And Tether was essentially used on exchanges like uh, Coinbase, Binance, Bittrex, uh, BitMEX, all of those. And USDT was basically used uh, on the exchanges to, to offset Bitcoin. So if I had Bitcoin or, or some other cryptocurrency in these exchanges and I thought the, the price of Bitcoin was gonna go down, I might sell it, take my USDT, hold on to it, and I felt comfortable that it was roughly pegged to the dollar. When Bitcoin goes down here, I'll sell, it, I'll sell my USDT and, and buy Bitcoin. And during this time, it, it, I'm, I'm holding the USDT or the Tether. Originally, the idea of Tether was it was backed with a dollar. So they had a dollar in the bank for every dollar of USDT that was minted. Um, there, there, were, there have been some issues where they couldn't keep up with the demand, so they kept minting coins. They didn't have dollars behind it. Uh, interestingly enough, most people in the world just kind of felt that, that, that were trading on exchanges just kind of felt that USDT was worth a dollar and therefore because we all decided it was worth a dollar, it was essentially worth a dollar. Um, they didn't always have the dollars behind it. There have been some issues with, with their, they, they weren't being open to auditors to come and audit their reserves. Um, and there, there have just been some issues with Tether. And, and therefore, we couldn't really use it outside of the exchanges. It was almost like a stable coin within the exchanges. But outside the exchanges, when we start talking about actually denoting transactions, we had to go to something else. So the something else that we've gone to is, is we've made an attempt, um, the, the company Circle has launched USDC, which is US dollar coin. And they have they have basically amassed dollars to represent every dollar of USDC that is out there. Um, they, they have it stored and they get audited every month. So every month the, the CPA from Grant Thornton takes a look and make sure that there's enough dollars to, uh, to th that every USDC represents a dollar that they actually have on reserve. So that's one way to do it. And all they're doing is making a digital representation of all the dollars that they have stored in the bank, which makes it much easier to, to transact. Um, it's not a whole lot different than what actually just happens in your bank, right? Your dollars are not sitting in a vault earmarked that they're your dollars. The bank just makes a, a, a representation or, or an accounting entry that says you have those dollars and we're just going to tell you that you have them. 
And the only time we're going to worry is if every single person comes and tries to take money out of the bank at the same time. So the, one of the last ways we've seen is programmatically, right? Programmatically, the, the company or the organization maker, the Maker Foundation has created a stable coin called DAI. Okay, and DAI is created programmatically. It, it, it basically has um, Maker created what's called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is a way to say they created code and the code monitors the, the value of DAI and keeps it pegged to a dollar using code. And the way it essentially works is the, the founders of Maker and, and the idea and the concept of this is you had a whole bunch of people owning ETH, the cryptocurrency, and ETH, as much as we wanted it and Bitcoin and such to be useful in transactions, it really wasn't. Uh, it, it was really for people that were holding it, but you couldn't denote contracts in it necessarily. You couldn't transact goods uh, because the value would fluctuate too much. So the way it essentially works, and without going into too much detail, because you can go on YouTube and you can find other, other videos, and if you really want, hit us up on Twitter or, or hit us on our website or something, and we'll do another video on it. But the way it essentially works is you put money into the, the uh, Maker DAO system, and you create a collateralized debt position. You put your Ether in here, and you're essentially getting loaned DAI. So let's say you put in enough ETH that's worth $150, you might get 100 die out of that. Okay, now why would I want to do that? I might want to do that because, again, I can't really use my ETH very well. Right? I, I, I can't transact business or anything. I can use die. So if I need to, to actually use money, I have two choices. I can sell my ETH. I can sell $100 worth of ETH for $100 right, on an exchange and take my money out and go use it, or I can hold on to it. I can create this debt position where I'm borrowing DAI and I, and I have to pay some interest rate back, but I have to collateralize it at about 150%. That means I need to put in about 150% of what I'm taking out. And the reason they do that is because Maker knows that, this is, that the price, the value of ETH is so volatile. So if the value of this drops to, say, $75, what happens is my position is going to get liquidated which means they're going to give me back my ETH, they're going to, they're going to burn my die, and I'm going to have to pay a, uh, a, a penalty. Okay, that's, that's kind of how they, they make some of their money and they, and they um, keep the system from going down. So then they can also change the interest rate if they need to. So if the value of die starts changing too much, if it deviates too far from $1, they change this interest rate and they make it either more or less adv advantageous for me to do this. So this interest rate started out really low and it's climbed into the, the double digits because so many people are trying to do this. And so when they make the interest rate go up, what they're saying is, whoa, 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 we don't need more people to do this. Or if you do it, we're just going to have to take more interest from you uh, in order to make it worth it so, so we can keep up with the, the demand for die. And what happens is when I when I pay this back, I might pay my hundred dollars back in die, and then I have to pay them the interest, and the interest is paid. This doesn't really matter, but the interest is paid in a token in a token called Maker, the, the, the token, right? So in the background, the this code is deciding if we're going to burn the the die tokens when they get returned, or we're we're going to potentially put them back into circulation. And this is all based on the value of of die at the time, but the goal is to keep it at roughly a dollar, okay, and to do it programmatically. Interestingly enough, this situation is essentially what the Federal Reserve of the U.S. is tasked to do, right? They're tasked to change interest rates and to control the supply of U.S. dollars in order to keep the value roughly where it is, to buy that same basket of goods. This is just code that essentially does the same thing. So then the, the question is, okay, now we have this stable coin uh, that, that we can agree is worth roughly $1. What do we do with it now? Well, now the, the, the great part, and, and from a finance world, um, you have so many more options now, right? Because now I can transact goods and services, right? And I can do them in, in contract, meaning I can decide I'm going to do something or I'm going to buy something from you at some future date and we're going to create the contract because we're pretty certain 
that we, we've denoted this in DAI or in USDC or something. And I'm pretty certain that today he, here on, on day one, that on day 90, it's still going to be worth roughly the same, right? So we can, we can create that contract. That's really important because now we can make this potentially a smart contract. So we've taken out the currency risk here. The other thing we can do that, that has become very popular is lending. Right now, the, the maker system we talked about already, the maker DAO system is already a, a way to lend, right? But now I can I can lend my die or I can borrow die, right? So if I want to lend it out, you know, someone needs to borrow five hundred dollars. Well, from a cryptocurrency perspective, we can we can create a smart contract loan, right? And and, and someone else is going to borrow 500 DAI from me, I can have them put up collateral, right? And that collateral could be E, so I can do the same thing that Maker is doing, right? And I can make them put up collateral and make sure that from a, a cryptocurrency smart contract perspective, they're going to pay me back. And this can all be, be controlled, audited, transparent, immutable, all those things that we love about blockchain, it can be done uh, using DAI instead of dollars, or it can be done using USDC instead of actual dollars, because now we can wrap these smart contracts, these codes, and these uh, rules around it that says that, okay, I, I now have kind of hooks into your, your wallet, your crypto wallet, that says if you're not paying me back on time, I'm just going to keep your ETH. You're not going to get it back. Or if the value of ETH goes down too far, I'm just going to liquidate it. I'm going to keep $500 worth, and I don't have to worry about you paying me back. I have everything I need, and we don't have to have some big legal language and all that, uh, or in, and a bunch of documents to sign. It all happens programmatically, and it's all on a blockchain. So lending is really important when it comes to um, stable coins. Uh, that, that's probably the maybe the biggest use case now for stable coins. Um, they're, they're also um, they're going to see a lot more use again when it comes to um, goods, services, when we start seeing trade and trade finance and, and such. We're really going to have to count on stable coins because we already denote you know, most of our world financial transactions in dollars. So we have to make sure that as we slowly make these steps towards using more decentralized finance and more programmatic finance and digital assets and such, that we have some sort of stable cryptocurrencies we can use so we can avoid the currency risk that we had trying to use Bitcoin or Ether or one of those uh, originally for some sort of um, financial transactions or, or uh, go goods and services transactions. Um, early on, one of, the, one of the big problems, again, is the, this currency risk. And now we, we've uh, hopefully, stable coins have kind of eliminated some of that currency risk. Now, we need the stable coins, especially the programmatic ones, to stay around a while and to, to uh, so that we can really feel comfortable that when they really start to get a lot of usage out of them, we really start to get a lot of use cases and adoption, that they can handle that kind of pressure. Right now, uh, it's a lot of enthusiasts that are sending die back and forth to each other through loans or through maker or, or, or locking them up in, in some sort of smart contract. When we start seeing businesses actually utilize stable coins, uh, we're really going to have to make sure that, that they can handle that kind of pressure. The code can stand up to that kind of pressure. But anyway, that, that's what stable coins are. That's kind of why they use, they're used. That's why they're so important. And how you're going to see them used is in the future, you're going to see um, items like loans and, and contracts denoted in some sort of stable coin because then we can wrap them in a smart contract, but we can also eliminate a great deal of that currency risk that we would see using traditional cryptocurrencies that are, that are volatile. So that's stable coins. We'll have some more uh, videos coming up soon. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go visit us at interaxis.io. Hit us on Twitter at interaxis8. Let us know if there are any other videos you want to uh, see and for us to do. And we'll see you soon.